Today we bring you Metroid Fusion. It's a 2D action platformer for the Game Boy Advance. It was released on November 18th, 2002, one day after the release of the legendary Metroid Prime. For a game that was released alongside one of the greatest games of all time, it is seemingly forgotten amongst all but the most die-hard of fans. Shockingly, Metroid Fusion sold less than half as many copies as Metroid Prime. Pretty surprising considering the Game Boy Advance was selling like hotcakes, and the GameCube, while only released roughly one year earlier, was struggling to sell. So, why did so many people pass on Fusion? It most likely came down to a lot of kids having to choose between receiving one or the other for Christmas, and most kids opted for the beautiful 3D experience that was Metroid Prime. I, however, was one of the fortunate kids that was able to receive them both. Thanks, Mom. I mean, thanks, Santa. Hey, he's still real to me, damn it. Well, let's dive right in and see what a lot of people, myself included, missed out on back in 2002. Like all Metroid games not named Federation Force, you play as the famous bounty hunter Samus Aran, who finds herself back on the Metroid homeworld, planet SR388. There, she gets attacked and infected by the parasitic organism simply known as X. Unaware of the severity of this attack by the X, Samus loses consciousness and crashes her ship. She is then recovered by the Galactic Federation and they discover that not only is her suit infected, but so is her physical body. Samus has to have all of her power suit parts surgically removed and is told that she is basically fucked. That is until she was given a vaccine consisting of the DNA of the baby Metroid hatchling. The baby. 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 He kinda looks like a baby. This being the last known Metroid in the galaxy and the natural predator of the X was everything Samus needed to survive and recover. However, she's had a bit of a makeover. I guess medical leave isn't part of the deal of Samus and the Federation. They really need to sign a better contract. After barely even having time to catch her breath, Samus is sent to the Biological Space Laboratories, or BSL for short, to investigate a mysterious distress signal. One of the big highlights of the game is that an ex-parasite has cloned Samus and has taken control of her old power suit. This clone is fully powered and as such is much stronger than you are for the vast majority of the game. You cannot damage or engage her in any way. You have to hide from her anytime you see her. These instances only happen at predetermined points in the game, but it is definitely cool and engaging gameplay that can fill players with a sense of dread, that the SAX could always be around the corner. You're guided on your quest by your brand new personal computer AI, which definitely isn't your old commanding officer, Adam. He guides you very linearly by giving you new missions and updates at the navigation rooms at the beginning of each sector. As is par for the course for Metroid games, you start off with little to nothing as far as power-ups are concerned. You shoot, run, jump, and bomb your way through the station and at six different biomes. Give you grass, fire slash desert, water, and ice biomes. Those are pretty standard fare for games in general, but you also have a night biome and a biome that is the replica of Planet SR388. Now, what purpose would a biome like this serve if the Metroids are extinct in the galaxy? Many of the power-ups you pick up are similar to those found in Super Metroid. Missiles, power bombs, speed booster, very and gravity suits, screw attack. Yeah, there is a reason this is usually a late game power up. You also have some new tech in the form of ice and diffusion missiles, but that's really it as far as new tech is concerned. A little bit disappointing considering the 8 year gap since Super Metroid was released. They even omitted the X-ray visor, grapple beam, and reserve tanks that appeared in Super Metroid. I understand the removal, but it's strange that Nintendo decided to take out more items than they added from its predecessor. The movement definitely feels tighter than it did in Super Metroid. Jumping is not as floaty as a previous game, but it's definitely pretty stiff until you acquire the space jump. Speaking of jumping, I don't know if this is because we played on an emulator, but wall jumping feels so goddamn inconsistent. I tried and tried on certain parts to successfully wall jump consecutive times to reach higher areas, but it just didn't let me even though I felt like my responses were spot on. Let's be honest, the wall jumping in Super Metroid was pretty broken. Samus could wall jump her way up the Empire State Building with this kind of wall jumping. But to simply break a mechanic just so that the players don't abuse it seems like a poor design philosophy. The fact that Metroid Prime released within a day of fusion, and yet it got a soundtrack with so many memorable tracks that wormed their way into your head is disappointing. Just comparing each game's menu themes, boss themes, and general ambient sounds, 
it's clear which game comes out on top. Shall we compare some other classic soundtracks to their GBA counterparts? I guess it's unfair to compare a handheld title with the console. All the GBA music sounds compressed and tinny. There's a lot less room for any deeper bass sounds or any accompanying background instruments. I mean, you can't really fault them for that, can you? That would be like comparing it to an NES game. The Upper Instar. Norfair. Crade's Lair. Crade's mother fucking lair. Listen to that dirty riff. God, it's so good. This game was released in 1986. 86? How is it that a game made in the 80s has a better and more memorable soundtrack than Fusion does? Turns out all the music for GBA games is compressed to fit onto these tiny carts. There are uncompressed versions of the soundtrack, and yet it sounds infinitely better than the compressed version. Not that they become memorable or anything, but it's frustrating to say the least. Another staple of Metroid games is backtracking. It's here, and it's done pretty well this time around. Each sector in the game has areas that are for early and late game. The enemies in the sectors also change and or become stronger when you return later on. Sector 2, for example, has these caterpillar-looking creatures that don't really pose a threat. But once you beat the first boss in the sector, you see that they go into cocoons. Later, when you re-enter Sector 2, they hatch from their cocoons and are actually pretty formidable. You return to Sector 5 two times after your initial visit, and each time you take a different path with your last visit completely changing the layout and look of a good chunk of the sector. Now a lot of people that have never played may be thinking, but what about sequence breaking? You cannot sequence break this game. I mean, you can, but it took 16 years for them to find a sequence break that involves memory corruption by breaking specific blocks and resetting the value of a specific block. It skips about one third of the game to let you leave the station to get to the credits. However, there is no known way to advance the story by skipping a boss and or acquiring a power up you are not supposed to have yet. This is still a very airtight game. I felt for a long time now that Fusion's visuals are often forgotten as one of its most impressive achievements. It's a Game Boy Advance game released in 2002, and it is one of the best looking games on a console that saw games released all the way up until 2008. The backgrounds do a great job of adding depth and immersion to each area. The weapon effects look and sound great. The sprites in this game are very high quality and absolutely still hold up. There's so much detail from Samus herself, to the space pirates, to rogue security robots, to whatever the f this thing is. Holy shit. Everyone remembers how amazingly Metroid Prime looked at the time of its release, but Fusion hit some incredibly high visual marks, especially for a handheld title, back then, and they still hold up to this day. On the scale of difficulty for Metroid games, Fusion was on the easier end of things. Learning the boss fight patterns was where almost all the difficulty lies. However, the game doesn't hold your hand or teach you most of the advanced techniques and there were a few puzzles that gave you zero clues how to solve them, so you just kinda had to bomb everywhere or shoot missiles at things until something works. It's a beautiful game with a simple and timeless art style. The tension and sense of dread that the game builds by giving you the option to fight the SAX, but it being a death sentence, is pretty unique. It shows you very quickly that your only option is to just run and hide. Fusion absolutely has stood the test of time and has aged remarkably well. Whether it be the graphics, level design or gameplay, this game still plays as well in 2021 as it did almost 20 years ago. The mission system structure, while rigid and linear, did not detract from the experience. The added dimension of always feeling like you're being hunted and the SAX could appear at any point without notice was definitely a welcome addition. Nintendo clearly echoes the same sentiment based on what we have seen so far about Metroid Dread. I highly recommend this game to anyone who has not played it before. 
especially if they play it before the release of Dread this October. Thanks for watching everyone. If you like this video, please consider checking out our other video on Yoshi's Island. Subscribe to see similar content in the future. See ya!